Hey everybody, Scott Detweiler here, back with our final installment of the Capture One Portrait Tutorial Retouching Series, where we're retouching this image without using any Photoshop and only the tools available inside of Capture One. Now, so far we've used uh, quite a few of the tools, as you can see from the layer stack we have over here. And the goal here is to have you follow along uh, to that end. This raw image is available uh, using a link in the description if you would like to follow along or use one of your own. But the goal here is to get you to try each of the different tools for retouching inside of Capture One and actually apply them to a real image. Remember, practice makes perfect, and just watching the video isn't going to make you any better, so please follow along. If you need to go back and rewatch a previous version or previous episode, feel free to do so. So today we're going to cram a bit more into a video, uh, so it's going to be a little bit longer, uh, but a little bit more intense as well. So again, if you need to stop and pause, uh, feel free to do so. To start this off, we're going to go back to the top of the layer stack. We're going to create a new layer, and I'm going to call this uh, color. I want to show you some things you can do, and I'm not saying you need to do them or should do them. Uh, I highly recommend you have a makeup and hairstylist available at any shoot you can, because they make a significant difference in the outcome of the imagery. So obviously, taking the time to set up your lights and make a theme to shoot and put everything together is uh, kind of thrown away if you don't have the model looking or the client looking their best. We oftentimes have hair and makeup available for most of my shoots because I really appreciate that industry. But if you don't, or if it's not exactly meeting your requirement for your theme, or after the fact you have an idea or an epiphany and you'd like to change things, these are a couple of techniques you can use. So I tend to do these all on the same layer. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a brush. So I'm just using a brush here and right click to bring up the brush settings if you'd like to make it bigger, adjust the flow and so on. And I'm going to just kind of uh, uh, apply this kind of brutally. I'm just going to put this here. So I'm just, I just hit M to show you what I drew. I'm just drawing a big mask here. And we're going to pretend that we want a different eyeshadow here. So I'm going to go over to the, the color and I'm going to go to my color palette here. And I'm going to bring up my color balance tool. Now typically we use this at the end for color grading. But we can also uh, kind of repurpose it for this situation. So what I want to do is try each one of these, and you're going to find they have a different effect. Uh, so for example, the shadow here will affect the obviously the darker parts of this area. And I'm over applying this. So remember, subtlety is king, right? Uh, this is a bit much. Double click to reset. Try the midtone, and you'll see that it's more across the entire area. And double click to reset, and then highlight. Uh, is just obviously the brightest parts, which are the ones that show off the most. If you're having an image that's a bit on the bright side, using the highlight to add a bit of color can also help it with printing problems because we've discussed in the past during some of my live streams, if you attempt to print something that is pure white, then you're going to have areas on the paper where no pigment is laid down and you might actually see the edge of where that pigment's applied. So by adding a bit of color, you're removing the fact that it's pure white, so some color is guaranteed to be laid across the paper, which can save you in some situations. So this is a nice little method. And we kind of did the same thing when we applied this shine two layer here uh, to the tip of the nose. We made sure this was not a pure white. And you can see by the color numbers up here at the top uh, that it is not 255, 255 all the way across. That is pure white. Uh, that's the number you don't ever want to see there. So you can use this method to apply color into areas of the image that you might be challenged with or perhaps want to make a different creative decision. Uh, the master also is an option, but it is kind of a brutal hammer and then it handles everything across the board. Uh, but again, if you're looking to cover an area like say the lips, you want to deepen the color there, this might be your best option. But I prefer to try and solve my problem with one of these three because it doesn't look so uniform and a little bit more natural. And again, we want to attempt to retouch this in a way that doesn't make it look like it's been retouched. Uh, so applying these in varied degrees of intensity uh, can solve that problem. Another area where color correction is handy is when you've gone through an image and maybe dodged and burned it significantly, and you need to add some color saturation back in or remove it, uh, which can happen if you have very large swings in changes of exposure. Uh, in those cases, you can actually borrow some of the work we've done in previous layers. For example, down here in our lighten area, uh, we had this area here, these masks. Let me do Alt M here to show you. This was the mask we applied to lightening the skin, which made a pretty substantial difference. 
And one of those areas we talked about can be a little bit over the top if you're not careful. But it's pretty cool is that we can go and we can borrow the mask from that here by right clicking. We can copy the mask from and then borrow it from the dodge. Now anything we apply here will be applied just to those areas. And this is helpful for adding color back into areas where saturation may have suffered uh, because saturation will change as you brighten or darken uh, an area of the image. Now in RAW, it's a lot more forgiving than it is in Photoshop, so this technique applies in both places. So now let's talk about color grading. Now, color grading is one of those areas that is very personal and it really depends on the mood of the image you want to create and you can create a lot of different moods just by color grading it differently. And there's a whole science behind this, but I'm going to show you my technique for, for doing it. Now there's two ways to approach it. One, and this is the lazy way, and the way I normally choose to use it is I just apply it to the background. So by color grading on the background layer, I know where everything is, and usually I don't need this many layers to accomplish a simple portrait. If you're looking to do something a little bit more flexible, you can create a new build adjustment layer and call this your color grade. Either way will be the same, except when you're done, you can also back the opacity of this layer off if it's a bit extreme. But by virtue of how you apply the color grade, you can kind of affect that anyway. So this is kind of an unnecessary step, and I usually just keep my color grading on the background layer. What I typically do is I start in the shadow, and I kind of make myself a promise I'm going to go all the way around. Uh, so even though I tend to gravitate toward the blue, blue side here, I want to go all the way around. And every so often, I'll get a happy accident, and I'll find something that really appeals to me. Like, this is actually kind of nice, this, this really golden tone in the shadows here. But I've promised myself I'm going to go all the way around, and then I'm going to try and make smaller and smaller circles and I'm just looking at the image I'm not watching I'm not watching over here I'm just looking to see when I'm really happy with the image and whatever the resulting location is isn't really that important to me I just have to like this this is the reason by the way that white balance is not that important to me during this process because I care more about the end result to me personally and not so much that it's technically correct so although I did really enjoy this over here again I'm going to kind of go I think with the blue, it wins just a bit. I'm just going to kind of wiggle it a little bit until I'm happy with it. And I'm going to look over and say, well, look at that. It really didn't end up anywhere. It should have ended up somewhere else. But um, I just found myself coming back to that area. I'm going to readjust this just so we have a little bit of grade to actually discuss. Uh, so something like this. And then I'm going to go and choose the mid-tone. I'm going to do the exact same thing. And this you're going to find is more of your skin tone. And if you're not sure if it's too red or too green, just push it all the way up, right? Even though it's insane, just get the color of the skin where you feel it's good fit for your mood of your image, and then use this slider to lower the intensity of it. You can also raise and lower the brightness of the midtone here, uh, but I tend not to use this slider. Uh, just in general, it isn't that handy for my workflow, but it is here uh, for your convenience. So. I'm going to kind of adjust this, uh, what I want for the saturation level of the mid-tone of the image. And then I would finally do the highlight. I find I don't typically use this highlight area, but again, uh, it might work for you. It, uh, it adds a little bit of something to the image, but I feel that it uh, oftentimes is a bit overpowering and it can, um, I say, dominate some of the brighter areas, which is what it's designed to do. And then master is the last one I would touch. Master guides the entire image. The one thing about master you have to be careful of is it can actually overexpose your image. So sometimes I'll turn on my exposure warning up here and just to make sure that I'm not running into a situation where I'm going to brighten something too much. Now, because we're still in raw, uh, we can always lower the exposure if we like, but uh, so I find something that I find pleasing. And then I would go back to the shadow and just make sure that everything is good to go here and just make little adjustments until I'm happy with the color grade. So something along this lines, maybe. I'll always. Kind of grab this here to make sure that I have the intensity where I want it. Because once I have the line straight, does all this does is move the circle in and out and not change the hue at all. Uh, it just changes the amount of saturation. So something like this. And maybe she's a little on the tan side there. Uh, so I just need to address this. I do like to walk away from an image for a while and come back and see if I still like it. And remember, you can still use the before and after. We don't really need this anymore. So we can kind of see where it is we've come from and where we are now. And I really like this. Now we come back and we're going to look at the exposure of the image. And I may decide to bring this down a bit. Uh, keep in mind that 
uh, the rule of thumb for uh, Caucasian skin is you'd like it to be one stop over 18% gray, which is right here. So I'm just going to kind of check that. And your dodge and burn process can lighten or darken the image substantially, as well as your color grading. So you may actually have to bring the exposure down a little bit. By holding down your Alt key, you can actually adjust this in minute increments instead of it having to be wild swings. So I'm just going to kind of sanity check this. It's okay if it's obviously not right on the money, uh, but it's a good guideline uh, to have. And then contrast. Uh, I tend not to add a lot of contrast. In fact, sometimes I find that using the contrast slider this way is more intriguing, uh, but not by far. Again, I don't like big swings in this tool. I prefer to keep them very small. Hold on the Alt key and just kind of again wiggle it until you're happy with the imagery that you see. Brightness is the same thing as exposure, except it doesn't deal with the edges of the curve. It deals more with the middle. So it's kind of akin to doing this with the curve. By the way, if you make a dot and you want to get rid of it, just drag it off. Uh, so by using brightness, you can kind of push or pull the middle of the curve. If you've already rendered an image in Photoshop, for example, and you want to come back to capture one to color grade it, the exposure slider is very muddy at that point because it's not dealing with raw data, which is where it's king. I tend to use the brightness slider as an alternative to the exposure slider at that point. That's just my strategy. And then finally, the highlight recovery and so on. Uh, if you've exposed your image properly, you shouldn't need this. Uh, this highlight recovery, by the way, can be used in a positive manner to kind of create that skin sheen that we did with these images or these layers here. Uh, and it can be used to augment that as well as uh, oftentimes create a similar effect if you don't want to go through those steps. Shadow recovery would be obviously what it is to bring in some detail in the shadows. Be careful not to hit this too hard or things become orange and weird. And finally, let's talk about adding a bit of clarity to the image. This is a the final little touch. And for those of you that actually made it to the end of the video, this is like one of my little secrets to making images really pop. So congratulations for making it this far. Give the video a thumbs up to congratulate yourself for making it here. So we're going to make a uh, one more layer and we're going to call this our clarity. And what we're going to do here is we're going to go to our color tool, our color tab and our clarity. And I'll make my brush bigger and I'm going to go over the hair. And I'm going to tell you two little secrets to making this look amazing. One is never touch skin with it because skin and clarity look terrible together. There are uses for clarity on skin uh, for solving problems with texture or doing other things like that. But in general, clarity on skin doesn't tend to look very flattering and uh, I, I tend to just avoid it. The other thing you want to do is make sure that it doesn't touch the background of the image. So I'd use my eraser and just make sure that it doesn't overlap. And why we do this is because it will create a halo around her head, making it obvious that some sort of manipulation has been done. So by avoiding touching either one of those two things, we will end up in this sweet spot. Note that we don't have to go nuts with our selection. We don't have to be super careful and do all kinds of crazy auto uh, masking and all that kind of stuff. This just will work just great. Hit M to turn that off. And then you have a bunch of different flavors of clarity in here. Punch is the one I usually prefer for hair. And just add a little bit of zing to it. Now we do have this layer. So it, because it's a layer and you can do more than one thing with it, I may actually choose to go into color balance and maybe push the mid-tone around a little bit to add some different colors here and there. But depending on if you need to do any correction, this is a good place to do that. So we can add a little bit of brown to her hair, for example. And it should all look realistic. There shouldn't be any sort of uh, nuances to tip somebody off that something has been done. But look at the difference in that. It's huge. And this, of course, is you know set to 11 right now. Uh, so you don't have to do it this strong. But I like this effect quite a bit. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of using the structure much because it makes things look very crispy. And that look can be um, pretty distracting if overdone. So uh, especially on hair, I tend not to use this. The last thing I want to do is do her eyes. So I'm going to click on eyes. And again, congratulations to you making it to the end of this arduous journey. <laughs> if you have followed along, by the way, with this portrait or your own, I would love to see them. Use the hashtag RetouchingWithScott on Instagram and post those. And I'll take a look at them. I'd love to see what it is that you guys have done with this. So for the eyes, I'm going to use the, kind of the same technique. I'm just going to use a brush and I'll make it a bit smaller. And I'm going to go and use a brush, not an eraser, by the way. I had it set to the eraser. They changed the dotted outline so you can tell if it's an eraser or a brush as of the last version of Capture One. And what I want to do here is I'm just going to make kind of a mask in through here. Hit M so you can see what I'm doing. Something like this. I'm not going to hit the sclera of the eye. 
I really don't uh, don't want to play with the white of the eye. I know a lot of people like to brighten the whites in the eye, and I just don't like that look. Because again, it, it looks retouched, and I like this to look as natural as I can. So that's what my mask is going to look like. Again, I didn't take a whole lot of time to, to figure it out. But one of the things that I do, because I do this so often, is I have a preset for this. And if I go up under my the hamburger menu here, that's what those three lines are called, and choose eyes, you can see all it does is make this a classic clarity with a 17 and a structure of 24. And I use these settings all the time, so I just made it a preset. Now, I'm not saying these are exact settings, but I just find these to be nice. And this looks really good to me. Uh, so if I turn this layer on and off, you can see it's subtle, but it adds just that little bit of something that makes the eyes look so much better and so much more interesting, even though we really didn't do much. Uh, I love that look. I oftentimes will actually use this on the lip too, just making a little line on the lip. Um, that same, those settings are just good enough to go there. And this is it. See, that's even a bit too much. And isn't that amazing that just that little change makes this so different? So maybe I'll just use it in one area. But one thing I would probably change if I were going to critique this image quickly would be that I would need to change the color tone of her skin a bit to add uh, a similar warmth to her face. It just didn't seem to catch the same thing. Uh, so to do that, I would just create a quick adjustment layer, call this body, hit G for gradient, and just draw a line. Hold on my shift key so it locks to horizontal, something like this. And then I would go and probably just go back to the color balance tool, mid-tone, and add a little bit of warmth to her skin, something like that. So we still have all the capabilities of the raw converter at our fingertips, which is so amazing. And of course, you couldn't do this in Lightroom. You don't have any options for for these types of things. So there you go. Congratulations. You made it to the end and we made a whole bunch of layers, but this shows the power of Capture One's retouching tools. And again, if you're not looking to move into Photoshop or you're trying to avoid Photoshop, you can do a lot in here. If you love this series, I would love to hear your favorite part of it in the comments below. Uh, what part of this was like um, informative to you? What was life-changing? What part did you not understand? Uh, those uh, comments, really helped drive me to make more videos. And I would love to know what other parts of Capture One you'd like to learn about and maybe areas where I can offer some insight as to how I use it in my business. Everybody take care, stay safe, and thank you for following me. Catch you next time.